Music, one of the most dazzling fruits of human civilization, can make us weep or make us dance. It's reflected the times in which it was written. It has delighted, challenged, comforted and excited us. In this series, I've been tracing the story of music from scratch. To follow it on its miraculous journey, misleading jargon and fancy labels are best put to one side. Instead, try to imagine how revolutionary and how exhilarating many of the innovations we take for granted today were to people at the time. There are a million ways of telling the story of music. This is mine. In the 31 years between the death of Richard Wagner in 1883 and the outbreak of the First World War, music was shaken by a series of rebellions. Russian music swept westwards exuberantly, as did the exotic sounds of distant continents. And symphonies and operas of astonishing intensity amazed and startled audiences. Modernism in music was born. The world was becoming a smaller place, with millions of poor European immigrants seeking refuge in the New World to join the white settlers, African Americans and Chinese workers already there. From this rich mix of musical cultures, soon to be heard on new-fangled record players and radios, would spring the blues, ragtime and jazz, in just over three decades, music underwent a series of gigantic convulsions. Change came in many different forms, some exciting, some bewildering. Revolution was in the air, and all of music's laws and traditions were about to be shaken to their roots. What happened was a series of musical rebellions. The first was aimed at displacing the musical giant of the late 19th century, Richard Wagner. His ideas, his style and his musical philosophy had been such a pervasive presence in classical music that what might have followed him was a plague of pseudo-Wagners. In fact, what followed in his wake was an explosion of musical activity that sought to do things very differently indeed. It may not always have been deliberate, but there was a kind of not-Wagner renaissance. All the things he hated most came to life. The French, for a start. In France, a new wave of composers made it their business to write music of deliberate simplicity and clarity, and to banish pretension and earnestness of all kinds. The French were about to enjoy a musical golden age, thanks to their reaction against Wagner. Their best 50 years ever in music blossomed after he went off to his personal Valhalla, with Faure, Debussy and Ravel leading a glorious riposte to German musical dominance. The movement was set in train by one of the most remarkable figures in music, Eric Satie. Satie's first Gymnopody of 1888, as well as sounding like a long, hot afternoon after a boozy lunch, can be seen as the first shot in a war to debunk pomposity and declutter French music. Satie, described by his tutors at the Paris Conservatoire as the laziest student ever, was an eccentric intellectual who hung out with other arty dreamers in Montmartre. Satie's music could hardly sound less like Wagner and what the Germans were up to. 
The irony is that there was a German influence on the work of Satie's Parisian contemporaries. Here's a clue. Composers like César Franck, Charles-Marie Vidor, Camille Saint-Saëns and Gabriel Fauré were all trained organists. And playing the organ means, above all, knowing one particular composer's work inside out. J.S. Bach. More than a hundred years after his death, these organist composers in France were invigorated and inspired by Bach's clarity and economy. Even the master himself might have admired Charles-Marie Vidor's famous Toccata. It was first performed by Vidor himself at the Trocadero Palace in Paris in 1889, and it's given a rousing send-off to many a newly hitched bride and groom ever since. The dignity and dexterity of Bach can also be heard in the music of Gabriel Fauré, perhaps the most talented of these French organist composers. Listening to Fauré after Brahms, Liszt, Wagner or Tchaikovsky is as if someone has spring-cleaned and redecorated a teenage boy's bedroom. Gone are the posters of death, psychological torment, superheroes and tragedy. The augmented piles of clothes have been put away and the windows have been opened to dispel the diminished sneaker-smelling air. Foray's exquisite music simply says chill, or perhaps refrigerez-vous. The exquisite pieces of Satie, Saint-Saëns, Fauré and the new wave of French composers were mostly small in scale. The next important step in the non-Wagner rebellion took place in the realm of symphonic music. And the composer who carried the torch for large-scale orchestral and vocal music after Wagner was about as different from him as a human being could be. Though he championed Wagner's operas as music director of the Vienna State Opera House, Wagner would have despised him because he was Jewish. He was Gustav Mahler. The hallmark of Mahler's music is that of openness. Unlike Wagner, Mahler invited into his music all the sounds and rhythms and the noisy diversity of the bustling East European communities at Vienna's doorstep, the capital of the sprawling Austro-Hungarian Empire. As an outsider in Vienna, a Jew, a Czech, a poor country boy in a profession full of toffs, it's not surprising that Mahler should identify with the folklore and music of his small town childhood. In his symphonies, it's possible to identify, for example, the klezmer style of strolling Jewish folk musicians. His music encompasses passing military bands, and he's not afraid to include boisterous children's choruses. Mahler's symphonies are music's gateway to the 20th century, a musical equivalent of New York's Ellis Island, where Europe's exhausted and oppressed peoples sought refuge and a new start. The musical cultures they'd left behind in Europe found a home in Mahler's generous symphonic embrace. One way we can see a modern perspective emerging in his music is its sense of reality, of truthfulness, warts and all. The frankness of his approach is a major break with the past and is much more characteristic of the 20th than the 19th centuries. How can music be honest? Well, before Mahler, if you were a composer and you wanted to write a piece about loneliness or despair or depression, you'd call it something generic like a nocturne, 
or a sonata pathétique. In an opera, you could have singers act out emotional or political issues, pretending to be someone from another era in a fancy costume. But Mahler stopped all this role-playing. He wanted to evoke the real, contemporary world with all its actual suffering and joy, without pretense. He told it how it was. Mahler took our worst fears and set them to music. This may seem an unremarkable concept to us, but in 1900 it was shockingly, distressingly new. The unflinching honesty of Mahler's approach is at times unbearable. From 1901, for example, he set to music five German poems called Kinder Totenlieder, songs on the death of children. The sentiments of the songs are those of a parent's most unspeakable nightmares. In Mahler's unflinching settings, these distant people of another century suddenly become like us. He's made them real. In a horrible irony, four years after he wrote the songs, Mahler's own five-year-old daughter, Anna Maria, died of scarlet fever. And Mahler himself was diagnosed with a terminal heart condition. When he died in 1911, he was laid to rest in her grave. But despite the understandable sadness and alienation we hear in his music, there is incredibly hope of something better, usually associated with childhood and youth, as in his Song of the Earth. The final chord of the Song of the Earth was described by the mid-20th century English composer Benjamin Britten as being imprinted on the atmosphere. but there's something else going on in Mahler's music that wasn't perhaps obvious at the time. It's deceptive. Because of its all-inclusive style, with its borrowings from ethnic folk music, and because of the intensity of feeling he wanted to convey, Mahler's music began to destabilize the centuries-old Western musical system he'd inherited. His pupils in Vienna, led by Arnold Schoenberg, actively wanted to dismantle completely the familiar systems that had underpinned all music for hundreds of years and replace them with a brand new system. This academic rebellion was later labelled serialism or atonality and it produced decades of scholarly hot air, books, debates and seminars and in its purest, strictest form, not one piece of music that a normal person could understand or enjoy in 100 years. That's not to say that serialism hasn't always had a cultish following, but for sure these composers weren't courting a mainstream audience. Had serialism had any chance of appealing to a paying public, one composer who would surely have opted into it was the musical magpie Richard Strauss, Germany's leading composer after Mahler's death. But he had other far more mischievous plans up his sleeve. He began his career, conventionally enough, in a musical style that owed much to Liszt and a little to Wagner. Thus spake Zarathustra is pretty typical, with its now legendary opening sunrise, made even more famous by Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey.
Kubrick uses the power of the piece to underscore a momentous leap forward in the evolution of man. the idea the film wants to convey, man's discovery of weapons, needs equally portentous music. No one did it better than Strauss. And yet, the ever-versatile Strauss could also write songs of heartbreaking, marlerish delicacy, like the song Tomorrow composed as a wedding present for his wife. On the surface of it, the words of Morgan seem to be optimistic about the future, and tomorrow the sun will shine again but it's also strangely melancholy. It seems to suggest, in fact, that there will be no tomorrow. It seemed at this point as if Strauss would continue to compose in this wistful but fairly traditional manner. But then he suddenly catapulted himself into musical notoriety with an opera of savage erotic power that shocked bourgeois society and created a sensation. In one fell swoop, from being the genteel Kapellmeister of the Austrian Belle Epoque, Strauss had transformed himself into the Che Guevara of the musical Rebels. The opera in question was Salome, staged in 1905. It was immediately banned in several countries and it gave new meaning to the term discord. Even before Salome herself had stripped off for the dance of the Seven Veils and scandalized the first night audience. Salome's final passionate solo, addressed to the severed head of John the Baptist, which she then kisses, was the Quentin Tarantino moment. You can either read Salome as a strong, independent young woman who gets what she wants by exploiting her sexuality, cleverly outwitting her stepfather, the king, in the process, or as a kind of demented junkie who lowers humanity's moral standards to rock bottom. Take your pick. Strauss, apparently, hedges his bets, giving the first mention of the necrophiliac kiss, possibly the most dissonant chord ever used in music at that point. It's like the final howl of a busted civilization. But we're not finished with her yet. After asking whether the taste of blood on his lips is actually the taste of love, Salome revisits the kiss in supreme triumph. I have now kissed your mouth, Yohanan, she screams, and Strauss unleashes a musical earthquake which might be construed as a sexual consummation. Again, make up your own mind. King Herod, who had encouraged his stepdaughter to dance in the first place, now ordered his soldiers to kill her. For this climax, Strauss reserved his most discordant and angry music yet. 
this point in musical history, it looked as though the dominance of Austro-German music that began with Bach in 1700 might continue indefinitely. Instead, a new force had emerged and was by the early 20th century the most exhilarating sound in Europe. In the closing decades of the 19th century, the sleeping giant of Russia had awoken. Music was never going to be the same again. And when it comes to rebellions, Russia is in a class of its own. For all of the 18th and most of the 19th centuries, Russia doggedly copied the culture of Western Europe, which the Russian court deemed more sophisticated and interesting than anything homegrown. Even Russia's most famous composer of them all, Tchaikovsky, who became a worldwide star in the 1880s and 90s, was still composing in a style that owed more to Beethoven or Brahms than to anything he'd picked up on the banks of the Volga. But there was something Tchaikovsky excelled at that was distinctly Russian and that contained within it the seeds of a coming revolution, dance. If, for Italians, the supreme expression of their love of music was the emotionally charged operatic aria, for Russians, it was dance. And Tchaikovsky wrote some of the most celebrated and memorable dance music of all time. The result of this flowering of dance is that the need for a driving rhythm began to change the character of the music itself, making it more robust, muscular and exciting. Russian music was about to explode into a life in a manner that was unprecedented and subsequently unmatched in history. In Russia, the invigorating, regulated beat of dance is everywhere. At the ballet, in operas, on the concert stage, lilting, driving, whirling, tiptoeing, leaping, gliding, jumping, gyrating and twirling. Russian music can't get enough of it. Presumably, it's the cold. You have to keep moving or your circulation will pack in. The rhythms of dance first powered this Russian awakening. The second vital element, which changed the melody and harmony, came from a renewed interest in Russia's own religious heritage. A new breed of composers, starting in the 1880s, turned their attention not to the musical traditions of Western Europe, but to those of their own, especially the centuries-old Russian Orthodox chants with their deep basses and thick eight or sixteen voice block chords. In the decades to follow, this ancient sound known as Znameni chant was to flow like a river into the choral texture of all Russian composers. No longer did they look west for inspiration. The fuse lighter of the Russian firework display about to unfold, the truly original creative pathfinder, wasn't cosmopolitan, well-travelled friend of the Romanovs Tchaikovsky, but a former military cadet who worked in the civil service and had a fatal vodka habit, Modest Mazogsky. <laughs> Mazogsky is quite simply the most original composer of the late 19th century, a one-off, whose ideas were new, not derived from other composers of his time. There's a reason for this. Mazogsky wasn't musically trained at a conservatoire and he wasn't a professional composer. He was self-taught and therefore blissfully unaware of the rules he was breaking. It was like he'd wandered on to Tsarist Russia's Got Talent, 
slightly drunk, and started improvising at the piano to everyone's amazement. But despite the naivety of his style, which earned him more than a little ridicule at the time, Mazorsky showed that Russian music could carve its own identity. To see how radically the music of Russia had changed in fewer than 40 years, listen to this coronation scene from A Life for the Tsar, an opera written by the Russian composer Mikhail Glinka in 1836. Glinka had his musical training in Italy, Austria and Germany, and it shows. Now listen to another Kremlin coronation scene from the thoroughly Russian opera by Mazogsky, Boris Godunov. This time, complete with colours, voices and glittering effects, tolling bells and echoing orchestra chimes, it's been thoroughly Russianized. Mazorsky died in 1881, his music virtually unknown outside of Russia, but that was about to change. So many of the seeds of the rebellions of late 19th century music can be traced to one extraordinarily fertile event. It took place in Paris in 1889, the centenary of the French Revolution. It was the World's Fair. Here, in the Trocadero, which overlooked the newly built Eiffel Tower, Vidor first played his famous organ toccata. And here also, non-Russian composers heard the music of Mazorsky for the first time. One such composer, then aged 27, was Claude Debussy. His visit to the World's Fair was a life and music-changing experience. What Debussy learnt from Mazorsky was that there was a way of building up the architecture of a piece of music that was an alternative to the developmental method that was bread and butter to Haydn, Mozart and Beethoven. The development approach was to take small cells of melody or rhythm or both and make up a whole discourse from them over a 15 or 20 minute period. So Beethoven is able to construct a whole symphony movement from this tiny idea Count how many times he uses it in just the first 40 bars of the symphony. That's 13. That's already 33 and counting. Debussy, inspired by Mazorsky, ditched 100 years of studious development technique and started over. Mazorsky, because he knew no better, and Debussy, because it suited his taste for experiment. What revolutionized Debussy's music more than anything, though, was a wind of change blown into the Paris World's Fair from very far afield. The World's Fair showcased exhibits and cultural tableau from all over the planet. Thanks to increased communications, the global village was starting to become a reality. What especially mesmerized Debussy was a Javanese village, complete with a gamelan orchestra 
with its gongs, bells, bowls and xylophone-like chimes. The particular sonorities and scales of the Gamelan Orchestra intrigued Debussy so much he was inspired to attempt an evocation of its eastern sounds on a western piano. Although he couldn't replicate the unfamiliar tuning of the bells, gongs and other metal bars of the Gamelan, or the exact division of the Asian musical scale, he could approximate it in two ways. One was to make use of the so-called pentatonic scale, the five notes that are common to all the world's musical systems, and which are especially prevalent in Eastern music. On a piano, the pentatonic notes can be found by playing just the black notes. There's a whole section of his prelude, Voile, Sails, which is all pentatonic. The other trick Debussy deployed was to allow his chords to hang over each other, overlapping and ricocheting from one to the next. This technique, on the piano at any rate, has the effect of eking out the sympathetic resonances, or harmonics, latent in the reverberating strings. Natural harmonics are hidden extra notes, usually quite high in pitch, that are found within any given sound, like the additional colours of the spectrum contained within white light. Every time you allow the felt dampers on a piano to clamp down on the strings, you shut off the natural harmonics from resonating. But Debussy wanted to do the opposite, allow the strings to ring like they would on a harp, his hanging chords, with the dampers kept away from the strings, were a kind of return to nature. Putting these ideas into action, Debussy created a new soundscape for the piano. The reformation of scales and harmonies that he introduced offered a whole new palette of oral possibilities. The piano had never sounded so exotic and so rich. By recalibrating the traditional Western scale on Eastern lines, Debussy's music was a radical departure from the classical style he'd grown up with, and his harmonic experiments based on Asian sound combinations were still influencing musicians, especially in jazz, half a century later. As well as kicking off a highly fruitful interest in what we'd call world music, the World's Fair in Paris had also put the new music of Russia on the map. Another of St. Petersburg's musical dynamos, Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, took over the torch and mined the golden seam of Slavic folklore in a series of operatic pageants put on around the turn of the century. Rimsky didn't just use folk stories in his plots, Crucially, he also started to borrow the melodic building blocks of Russian folk music. Sparkling entertainments laid down a challenge to Rimsky-Korsakov's most talented pupil, 
then a complete unknown. That challenge was to blaze a path for Russian music and put Russia onto the cultural map once and for all. And boy, was the challenge accepted. Rimsky Korsakov's pupil was Igor Stravinsky. Stravinsky's combustible arrival on the world music scene was stage managed by an entrepreneurial art, dance and music impresario, Sergei Diaghilev. In 1909, he created a dance company in Paris, the Ballet Russe, in order to produce annual festivals of modernist Russian ballets. He approached Stravinsky to compose the music for one based on an ancient Russian fairy tale, the Firebird. When he was commissioned, Stravinsky was unknown and third choice for the job. Three years later, he was both the most notorious and the most eagerly championed composer in all Europe. The Firebird's scenario, an amalgam of several versions of folk tales about a magical bird, combines supernatural characters and beasts with the natural, the fantastical world with the human world. Stravinsky gives these two worlds different styles of music. Human characters, like the 12 princesses in the story, are given folk song derived melodies based on the common Western musical scale. The fantastical creatures and characters, on the other hand, are allotted a much more exotic and complex musical palette, often based on the so-called octatonic scale. This non-Western sounding octatonic scale had been the feature of the music of Stravinsky's teacher, Rimsky Korsakov, especially when depicting the magical, malevolent or the mysterious. When Stravinsky borrows from Russian ethnic folk music like this, he doesn't lift it straight, but distorts it through a mischievous prism. In field recordings of peasant folk music, the educated bourgeois Stravinsky had discovered a raw ritualistic world from way beyond the frontiers of industrial civilization. His instinct to repackage it for a Parisian audience was brilliantly provocative. Stravinsky's rebellion against established musical conventions wasn't just about exotic scales and weird jingly jangly sounds he injected into the orchestra. Stravinsky, like Mussorgsky and Debussy before him, wanted to find a way of assembling a musical structure without using constantly developing nuggets of tune. Stravinsky, in particular, wanted to tell his ballet stories a different way. He created a montage, an oral jigsaw, one tune followed by a different tune followed by a different tune in tumbling succession. For this reason, ballet, with its short, restless, kaleidoscopic episodes, was the form for which Stravinsky was born to compose. find the idea of musical collage, the mix, the remix, the iPod shuffle and the mashup completely normal. But we shouldn't forget how bewilderingly unfamiliar an idea this was to the musical establishment of the early 1900s.
When the Ballet Russe took Stravinsky's second ballet, Petrushka, to Vienna in 1913, the scandalized musicians refused to play it, describing it as dirty music. All of the radicals, Mahler, Debussy and Stravinsky, were dismantling the old system whereby musical ideas carefully unfolded one thing after another. They wanted everything at once. Stravinsky, like all Russian composers, was turned on by the rhythmic urgency of dance, but he did something very unusual with that rhythm. Whilst Mahler had layered melody on melody, tangled together like a twisted knot, and Debussy had manipulated blocks of adjacent sound overlapping one another, Stravinsky went one step further, superimposing simultaneous rhythms on top of each other. Polyrhythm, as it has since been dubbed, had long existed in African tribal drumming, improvised on the spot by highly intuitive, skillful players. But polyrhythm, conceived from scratch by a composer, written down on the page, imposed on the Western Symphony Orchestra player by player, this was utterly, breathtakingly novel a concept. It was as if Stravinsky wanted the past and the present to coexist in one dimension, the prehistoric ritual of his dancers and the modern cacophony of the industrial world, and the only way he could conceive it was to make parallel, competing rhythmic patterns fight for the same space. It's complicated, but it's magnificent. But here's the thing. The Rite of Spring, which premiered a hundred years ago, was the high watermark of musical modernism. It therefore presented progressive music with a dilemma. Where the hell to go from here? Neither Stravinsky nor Debussy in 1913 would have guessed where the answer to that question would come from, never mind just how massive the forces of change were going to be. After all, revolutions don't always start with a bang. Mary had a little lamb, its feet was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Thomas Edison is credited with the invention of recorded sound in 1877, but in fact, the first ever recording was made nearly 20 years earlier in France. This is the earliest known surviving recording of a person singing, making the man who made it, Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville, the true inventor of recording, not Edison. The recording was made on a machine now virtually forgotten, the phonautograph. Here's the amazing bit. The inventor's aim was to be able to study sound in graph-like form. What he couldn't do was play the sound back. Then, in 2008, American engineers using sophisticated digital technology were able to convert the markings on the paper back into sound. The French folk singer of 1860 miraculously sang again. Sort of. The phonautograph had begun a process that was totally to transform music. Very soon after Edison invented a machine that could play recordings back, a new breed of musician researcher popped up in virtually every country, travelling around remote rural areas, recording and preserving the folk songs they persuaded doubtless bemused locals to perform for them. These field recordists captured the oral and musical culture of communities now long disappeared. But the real future for recorded sound was in the reproduction of music that was already popular. The first million selling record was Caruso's Vesti la Giubba in 1907, just before radio broadcasts began. As well as live music, radio also played records, thus boosting their sales. The advent of recording made the huge wealth of music already written by 1900 increasingly available to millions of people across the world, vastly expanding their musical horizons 
and turning something hitherto expensive and elitist into an ordinary commodity. This was a very good thing. Recording also began to put in front of a mass audience forms of folk and ethnic music that were, up to then, unknown outside their local communities. The music that was boosted most of all by recording, as it turned out, was that produced by African Americans, beginning with spiritual songs. African American slaves and their descendants, living in conditions of oppressive poverty, developed a form of religious song, the spiritual, which seems to have been an amalgam of half remembered African call and response chants and missionary hymns. Swing low, sweet chariot, come in for a carry me home. Swing these spirituals of the Deep South were rich with Old Testament references to the slavery of the Israelites, visions of redemption and heavenly justice. I looked over Jordan, what did I see? Come in for to carry me home, a band of angels coming after me. The existence of the spiritual was for a long time mostly unknown to the white population of the United States, let alone the rest of the world. But a long fuse had been lit. People go to baseball and like to play good with two. If you ask them about their religion, they'll say the gift as good as you. The Fisk Jubilee singers, who were themselves the children of slaves, began to make fundraising tours singing what were called at the time Negro spirituals. But strangely, one of the first musicians to put this music in front of a middle-class American audience was an Englishman. The Edwardian Samuel Coleridge Taylor caused a sensation on three trips to the USA, conducting his own compositions. In one of them, we can hear early and tantalizing evidence of the melodic style of what came to be known as the blues, which, albeit in different disguises, went on to dominate the music of the 20th century and beyond. The clues we're looking for are so-called flattened degrees of the musical ladder, or scale, at the third and seventh position, especially when the phrase is heading in a downward direction. And here they both are, one after another, in this melody. Third, seventh. The blues, as it developed slowly and piecemeal amongst former slave communities in the USA in the final decades of the 19th century, clung resolutely to the flattened thirds and sevenths, and does so to the present day. Indeed, they became known as blue notes. Revivalist spirituals, the call and response, or holler songs of the Deep South, all derived from their African origins, went into the mixing pot of the early blues. But also mixed in were chords borrowed from hymns and parlor and vaudeville songs, and the folk songs of other members of the American underclass. Yeah, that you never, you never. Yeah, 
there's been considerable research into song forms of the poorest Americans of all ethnic groups in the 19th century. It reveals the influence of Anglo-Celtic folk music on the growth of the blues. This folk music was learnt from the African Americans' co-workers in the cotton fields and on the railroads, many of whom were from the British Isles. Amongst these song types are hundreds which lament the burden and misery of the labourer's life. Typical is the iconic American work song, The Ballad of John Henry, the Steel Driving Man, which eventually became a blues standard. It celebrates the futile battle between an African-American railroad worker and a new machine designed to replace him. Music historians have traced the shape back to the much earlier British ballad, The Birmingham Boys. Listen out for the overall storytelling shape and the repeated line at the end. In Birmingham town there lived a man And he had such a lovely wife And so dearly she loved company As dearly as she loved life Boy's life As dearly as she loved life now here's one of the many later versions of John Henry. John Henry was a little baby Sitting on his mother's knee He picked up a hammer in his little right hand Says a hammer's gonna be the death of me Lord, Lord, a hammer's gonna be the death of me One of the changes that's happened to the tune crossing the Atlantic is that it's become entirely pentatonic Remember those five basic notes prevalent in Eastern music that Debussy imitated? And who were the other railroad workers toiling alongside the British, Irish and African-American labourers? Now, even to suggest any European influence on the blues is controversial. And it's entirely understandable that there should be sensitivity about any non-African elements in the origin of the blues. Since the music of the slaves, from which it sprang, was so often a lament or a coded protest against the harsh treatment they received, some African Americans quite naturally resent the idea that the blues could in any way have been influenced by the very people who enslaved their ancestors. But the fact is that music does not observe racial or national boundaries it's a free-flowing river, open and available to all cultures, owned by none. Whatever elements went into its kit of parts, the early blues musicians made something unique and lasting of their own. This same intermingling of styles and traditions can be seen in the arrival at around the same time of ragtime, which became a kind of craze. Rag, or ragtime music, originated in St. Louis and Chicago bars and brothels from house pianists copying the popular marching band style of the 1880s and 90s, a fashion that reached its peak with the band leader John Philip Sousa. In order to emulate the whole band, bass, accompanying chords and tune, the pianist had to leap about the keys frantically, resulting in a quite virtuoso left-hand motion from bass to chord and back. On top of this accompanying umpa, the rag pianists wove a catchy tune that pulled the rhythm around, a technique called syncopation. Syncopation is like talking with the emphasis on the wrong words to create a jerky sound. Listen to this bit of Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag without syncopation. And now with Joplin's syncopations, which feel like they're tripping ahead of where you'd expect them to fall.
ragtime picked up syncopation, a playful jumping ahead of the tune, from the banjo or piano accompaniments for cakewalks, a jokey form of dancing that plantation workers had invented for their own amusement in lampooning imitation of white folks' larded da ballroom dancing. The white folks in question used to enjoy watching their staff's cakewalk parties not realising that what they thought was a comic and ludicrous African-American dance step was actually a caricature of them. Along with the cakewalk, another offspring of ragtime was a hyper-syncopated form of piano and band playing that flickered into life in the Storyville district of New Orleans. Charismatic performers like Jelly Roll Morton took it on tour around the southern states in travelling vaudeville shows. Though Jelly Roll called a lot of his numbers blues, we now know this is the beginning of a distinct genre of its own, jazz. From now on, this music took on a life of its own. As up-to-the-minute blues and its many offspring began to revolutionise popular music, classically trained composers found themselves outflanked and increasingly unloved. Given the choice, the general public voted with their feet in their millions and took the populist path. The coming century would see popular music, especially American popular music, sweeping the planet. And yet... Faced with the twin rebellions of dissonant modernism and the mass market, the classical tradition found an ace up its sleeve and played it with impeccable timing. In a world of turmoil and change, its response was nostalgia. Edward Elgar's most famous piece, Enigma Variations, embodies this response. As the world began to slide towards a final showdown of the European empires, this music reminded people what they were about to lose. From Elgar and Vaughan Williams in Britain, Grieg in Norway, Sibelius in Finland, Respighi in Italy, Rachmaninoff in Russia and Richard Strauss in Germany, a musical style of tender, old-fashioned melancholy seemed to want to hold back the relentless passage of time and progress. That this music is so popular in our own time testifies to its enduring appeal and perhaps our own continuing need for its soothing balm. It may also indicate that in a crowded market, classical music's unique selling point is, like it or not, its ability to wrap up the past like a beautiful gift. In the next programme, we trace how all the developments of this 30-year period found affirmation in a golden age of popular music. Classical music went undercover, morphing gloriously into a variety of new musical forms made possible by the onwards march of technology. Another glimpse behind these spangly curtains next night on BBC HD. We're on the cruise ships with the comics taking on one of the toughest jobs in the funny business.